Almost live from Silicon Valley, California, brought to you by Mimosa Network. It's the Dustin and Eric Podcast Show. Hi, I'm Dustin. And I'm Eric. And we're on episode number five today, talking about building your infrastructure. So we'll talk about installation, configuration, and testing of your equipment. Today we have a special returning guest, Jeff Jones from Mimosa Support. Hi, Hello, Jeff. everyone. Hey, good to see you. Good to so, be here. So, Jeff, you got anything cool going on? Well, I think the coolest thing is uh, all the customers we're helping right now with the B24. Uh, we have quite a few take rate going on with that, and uh, it's been exciting seeing all the enthusiasm around this new product. Yeah, I love the B24. It's honestly the, the easiest backhaul I've ever put up. You bet. Even with it being such a narrow beam, it's easy as pie. I, uh, like I said, I've never had anything easier. S- small, clean, form factor, tiny, excellent. All right, so now uh, we're going to catch up with uh, me and Eric here. So, Eric, did you have anything uh, cool or fun you did this weekend? Uh, yeah, I wanted a uh, high-altitude uh, balloon launch. I, I, we watched that from uh, UC Berkeley this weekend. So they launched a high-altitude balloon filled up with heat and let, him, let it go out of Berkeley. And, uh, and I was one of the chase vehicles. We chased the, uh, chased the transmitter, had dual transmitters on it and some scientific uh, instrumentation and stuff. And uh, it went east about 150 miles, and uh, we got on site and tried to track the uh, transmitter and unable to uh, find it. So where'd it go yeah. down? Uh, it was uh, just right near uh, Yosemite Valley. So it burst at 105, just over 105,000 feet, and then once it descended, it continued to move east another 40 miles. So by the time we got on site, we were unable to uh, find the transmitter. It was probably the batteries were dead, so we weren't able to recover the unit. Well, maybe somebody will turn it in. Crazy, huh? Yep. (laughs) So uh, I did a couple of things this weekend. I went to the Cherry Blossom Festival in uh, Cupertino. Uh, First time ever going to a Cherry Blossom Festival, but it was pretty fun. Tons of vendors, tons of cool, authentic uh, Japanese stuff. Actually, uh, I bought a a kimono for my wife. She really loves that kind of stuff. So That's neat. And then went and saw the Avengers, which nice. I think uh, at least us three here at the table have seen it now. So uh, definitely a great movie. Should totally go watch it. What happens at the end? Everybody dies. That's not true. It's only like 90%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, well, while we're talking about weekends, uh, did you do anything cool this weekend, Jeff? Not a whole lot. I just uh, enjoyed uh, some time away from work and uh, had Great time with the family and went out and enjoyed the sunshine. It was really nice. Oh, yeah, we're having some really great weather right now. Yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, we'll move on here. And now it's time for the interrogation room where we answer submitted questions from the audience. All right. So question number one, can you tell us about EIRP? Yeah, effective isotropic radiated power. Pretty much you take the, uh, take the transmitter output and add it to uh, antenna gain, and you get a total, uh, total power in a a given direction. Uh, Also, this uh, EIRP, these limits, uh, they're uh, they're governed by the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, Union, uh, Region 1, 2, and 3. One, uh, Region 1 being uh, Europe, Africa, Russia, two, uh, North and South America, three, Asia, Indonesia, Pacific, Australia. So there might be different, there's limitations in uh, each of those, uh, each of those regions, huh, Jeff? That's correct. Okay. Question number two. Uh, what is the minimum SNR value that I should try to achieve on my link? Jeff, do you want to cover that? Yeah, so in order for the radio to achieve a, uh, a potential of MCS9, you want to get a SNR value of 27 or greater. With fade margin, uh, rain fade, or just overall fade, uh, we like to see somewhere above 30 dB. So uh, 30 to 33 dB is ultimately the best um, goal to aim for, but minimally you want to have a 27 SNR dB. Is there an upper limit to that? No, not necessarily. Um, obviously, if your radios are so close and the power's up too high, you can start having issues with uh, compression zone um, matter. So you, you really don't want to go above uh, 40 d, uh, dB with your SNR or you're going to be running into other issues. Uh, question three. 
How can I keep customers from accessing equipment on my network? So there's a, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. Uh, one is by assigning a, a different set of IP addresses to your actual radio equipment and the equipment on your network, and then assigning a different set of IP addresses to your, your customers' uh, equipment, like routers and their IP addresses, so they don't know what IP address uh, or subnet your, your customers are on. You can also enable uh, management VLANs on your Mimosa equipment. And if the customer doesn't know what VLAN ID you have, which they really shouldn't unless they work for you, uh, they have no way of knowing how to access your equipment, even if they do have IP addresses for that equipment. All right, number four. How can I automate the configuration of my client radios? So, uh, again, you've got a couple of ways to do this. One, you can use the, uh, the Mimosa app on your phone and using a G2. And you can save a configuration when you're setting up a radio for that particular AP. Uh, when you set up another client radio, you can pull that configuration up and change whatever few settings you might need. Uh, like if you've assigned static IPs to your radios, you can put that in, the name of the radio, just minor details, but it, it keeps the uh, most of the information already there, so you just hit save and configure and you're good to go. Uh, you can also use, uh, starting in 240, our auto provisioning, which uh, uses a radio server to push out VSA files to your radios. Um, you just go through the auto config process, connect it to the access point, as soon as it connects, it starts pushing all the configuration out to that, con that client radio, and you're done. All you have to do is really aim it at that point. So, uh, again, just those two ways uh, right now to automate your configuration of client radios. And if you need more information on that, there is some really good uh, articles on our help site if you uh, are interested in how, this, how to set up your radius authentication uh, process and automation process. All right. Uh, number five, what cabling do you recommend? I assume that this question is referring to Ethernet cabling, but I'm going ahead and making it a little broader than that. So for Ethernet cabling, we uh, recommend Cat6 shielded cable. Uh, we ourselves use Shireen DC2021 on all of our installs, and this is what we recommend to all of our customers out there. Uh, we make sure that the customers that we go and visit actually have this cable and uh, they install it while we're there, put it up on their new equipment. Uh, so far, haven't had any issues out of it. Uh, for LMR or coax cabling, we recommend uh, LMR 400. It is the uh, least lossy of the LMR cables out there. We want to make sure that you have the least amount of loss on your connectorized radios. Also, the, of course, it's the smaller RG195s and uh, 240. So you get a nice little bend radius. Maybe you're coming off the C5C. Uh, make sure when you order these products, too, especially like these 50-ohm uh, RG products or LMR, that it actually has that stamped on there. That It's not 75-ohm video or satellite uh, TV stuff. It's 50-ohm, uh, and that it actually is uh, uh, from a reputable uh, source. Right. Uh, six, should you staff a network engineer or contract one? So in my personal opinion, you should always have a network engineer on staff. You shouldn't have to rely on uh, somebody who doesn't work for you or is remote. You want to make sure you have that person in-house where they can do any kind of work or engineering that you need immediately. And also, when you have one on staff and you don't contract one, you have to wor worry about them uh, running up the clock, basically, or charging you for more time than they're really working when they're making a uh, you know, networks for you or working on your network for you. So you have a little more control over what you have going on in your own office instead of relying on somebody you don't really know or mm. don't have any real control over. Uh, seven, I've been told that speedtest.net and other speed tests give incorrect results. Can you elaborate on this? Jeff, do you want to answer, answer this? Yeah, so with speedtest.net, it's a great tool for off-the-fly uh, testing over the Internet. The problem with the speedtest.net is that you're using the, the Internet as part of the uh, connection, so you're really subject to the traffic uh, speed of the Internet. So if you're in a, a congested area where there's a lot of Internet activity, you may not have a, a proper or accurate uh, result. The other more important reason why speedtest.net is really not 
shouldn't be used with uh, per performing tests is that it only tests one data stream, TCP data stream. Whereas our radios, we like to see four to 10, possibly up to 20 data streams being tested at one given time in order to really show the maximum throughput of the radio, its capabilities. If we're, on, um, we're in a, uh, maybe you're in a client's house, what about, so there's three people standing together and they all have smartphones. And uh, it's a good, idea, good practice just to have one person do the, a, speed, a general speed test. Right. If you want to get the Thank most you. accurate uh, speed test, uh, whether you're using the speed test tool or what we prefer that you use is the iPerf tool, which is a uh, freeware that you can download. It's a client-server application. Uh, you would set that up on two laptops, one on each side of the link that you're testing. But more importantly, you want to make sure that you're uh, testing in an unloaded or unused network in order for you to really show its, its capabilities. And when you're using a laptop, make sure that the, the port on it's a, a gig port and not a 100 meg port. Yes, that's important. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll go ahead and get into today's main course, which is uh, building your infrastructure. So first we're gonna talk about uh, installing radios and antennas, cabling, uh, grounding, and battery backup. And then we'll talk about uh, configuration and testing of the equipment uh, testing connectivity, and then talking a little bit about interference. So when you're installing your radios and antennas, you really need to look at the physical spacing of your antennas compared to everybody else's antennas. So you need to find a space on the tower to actually put your antenna, but you want to try and keep as much space between you and other interferers as possible. So Mimosa recommends at least 10 feet between you and somebody else if possible. But, of course, I know, and everybody else in this room knows, that sometimes that's not possible on a tower. There's hardly any room. But as much space as you can get as possible will help. Uh, you also uh, need to look at uh, spacing your antennas even further away from any kind of LTE antennas. Yep. If you're using any kind of GPS antenna like the B5, the B5C, the A5C, uh, you have a, a risk of being interfered with GPS-wise because LTE is on a harmonic of... Uh, mm -hmm actual GPS communication. So if you start having GPS problems, then you're probably parked a little too close to an antenna, or you've got your antenna up inside the tower where it can't see the sky. So it's kind of, you have to go through a little troubleshooting there to figure out which is the case. You need site photos that would definitely help you when you install stuff. So make sure you take good photos of all of your installs that we can always go back and reference them and compare them to the site as it is now. You can see if people have installed something new or if things have changed. You also want to make sure your towers aren't overloaded. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> or you might end up with a tower on the ground, all of your equipment destroyed, everybody else's equipment destroyed. It's really important to make sure that just because your space on the tower doesn't mean that it can handle any more weight or any more wind load. So it's good to have an actual engineer come out and do an engineering yeah. study on the tower. Make sure it's an actual sound, secure tower before you deploy your equipment on it. And then you need to look at, do you have a clear line of sight from point A to point B? You need to make sure you don't have any Fresnel zone obstructions. If you do, then you're going to reduce the data rate of the, the connection between A and B, or you might not have a connection at all, which comes to uh, you know checking out the design tool, making sure your alignment's correct. So in the design tool, we've got a real cool uh, installation uh, report, and it shows you what direction your radio should be pointed at each other. It's got the heading. It also has the tilt of the radios that we know how much up tilt or down tilt they need. So uh, it's good to plan your link out in the design tool before you actually go out and actually put it up because it has all the data that you need to know which direction you need to go with it. Uh, you can also, you know, look at landmarks and stuff like that. But this is a definitely a good start for you. And we have plenty more resources on our YouTube page that show us, you know, installing and aligning antennas. And we also have plenty of help documentation on the website. We always keep tr up to date that you can also check out on installation of your antennas. And then we're going to move on here to uh, real versus fake cabling. So there's tons of knockoff cabling products and cheaply made cable products out there. And the cheaper cable will definitely affect your performance drastically. So I have a picture here for those of you who are actually watching the show. Uh, the top cable in the left picture is actually a legitimate cat 
5E cable, whereas the bottom one is a knockoff cable. Uh, the top cable actually has twisted pairs, which help cancel out electromagnetic interference, which is also referenced as EMI. The bottom cable is not twisted at all, which would in introduce a ton of interference into your cabling, which would cause slower speeds, uh, you know, significantly lower speeds or actual port flapping, which uh, you can see here where you have uh, up and down on these logs where it's showing a, a thousand full down, thousand full down. It's not always what causes the problem, but almost always it's cabling that causes these problems. Also on the, on the uh, previous picture there, uh, make sure that you don't have a, a, a copper clad. You want, you know, solid, real copper on each of the eight conductors. Right. Right. And so because of cabling, uh, like we talked about in the, the Q&A session earlier, uh, we definitely recommend uh, Cat6 shielded cabling. Uh, Shireen or Primus are, are two very good examples of that. And then make sure you have the appropriate Cat6 shielded cable ends for the cable you're using because if you try to use Cat5 E ends, uh, the Cat6 cable has a slightly larger diameter uh, copper, so it most likely won't fit in the connector well or at all. And mm -hmm. you'll have more trouble or more cabling pro or Ethernet problems if you try to do that. So it's best to just buy the correct cable ends the first time around instead of trying to fight with what you have. We also have a really good cabling video on YouTube that uh, I did uh, a couple of months back that helps show you how to actually crimp cable correctly and put these exact ends on your cabling so you have less problems as you go on. Use a, also, you could use a, a cable mapper. Uh, you know, they usually start at at least uh, $39 and just go up through the roof up to uh, six, five, six hundred dollars for something a little more fancy. But uh, it maps out all eight conductors, including including uh, the shield as well. For right. The ninth. Yeah. Make sure everything is uh, solid on both ends. So be wary, though, that the cheaper testers might not tell you if you have a gig or 100 meg. It just will tell you if the right. cable's good or not. So, so be conscious of that as well, that you have a tester that will tell you if it's a 100 meg or, or a gig. Otherwise, you'll just think the cable's good and not know why you're having problems. And then we come to grounding. So... Uh, Again, if you're, if you're watching from home, we have a picture of a C5 here that wasn't grounded. It's basically a giant lightning rod. And so it got hit by a lightning strike directly. So the, the lightning hit the radio, went through the cable, followed the cable all the way inside into the house and actually blew out the, uh, the 110 uh, c power inside the house, burnt everything all the way down, burnt everything once it got into the house. So... You want to make sure that your, your cable and your radios are grounded. So you want to make sure you're using the, the shielded cabling. You want to make sure that your radio has some kind of ground on it. Or, you know, you at least have a NID somewhere in line on the Ethernet cabling to help try to prevent the lightning from traveling on into the house. You're almost always going to lose the, uh, the equipment no matter what. But at least this will help prevent a lot of the internal damage that you'll have to pay for because the insurance company will demand you pay for the damage because it's ultimately your fault for the way you installed your equipment. So just make sure it's done right the first time. Uh, I've actually have personal experience from this. Uh, we have actually had a, at my last job a previous installer who installed you know a, a radio on a super tall pole in a real flat area of land, tallest thing around, lightning hit it, blew the radio completely apart. It was all scattered all over their lawn and lightning traveled through the wall, down the cable, lit everything on fire in the wall, lit everything on the other side of the wall on fire. Luckily, they were home. They had a fire extinguisher. They put everything out. But uh, the company I worked for ended up having to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to repair that damage because, again, ultimately, it was the company's fault because of the installer. Yep, yep. Also, looking in a general sense, you're looking for just ESD, electrostatic uh, discharge. Uh, you don't say you don't live in, uh, in in the Caribbean or Florida or New Mexico, but you're just looking at uh, uh, just to discharge some of this uh, buildup on these uh, masts, on these poles, on the front of this PVC, whatever the materials are for your antennas and your parabolic reflectors. You want this stuff to kind of uh, discharge or dissipate on the outside of the dwelling, the house, the telecom shelter, 
the uh, fourth floor, b- top of the rooftop, or whatever. So maybe you don't you don't experience lightning, but there are buildups uh, d- during the year, and we want to kind of take some of this stuff directly to Earth uh, when when we can. And I know one of the common misconceptions is people think they have to run the ground cable from the radio all the way down to the ground, but there's sometimes places where you can ground on the roof or you know yeah. partially down the side of the building or the house, depending on where you're at. Uh, Eric and I were at an install just a few weeks ago in L.A. where they had run the cable all the way down to the ground, but there was an A.C. unit or something of the like. Yeah, some copper, right, some part of the HVAC system or copper that will go to earth. There's also uh, electrical conduit stuff you can can take a ground clamp or strap to, et cetera. You just want to make sure that what you're grounding to is actually grounded before you do it or it's not really going to help you, but... Most of the time, stuff like that should be grounded per code, and most people are inspected and made sure that it's installed correctly. So uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's good to check that out and make jobs easier on you and to make sure everything's properly grounded. So next we'll talk about battery backups. So uh, battery backups are, are real popular. Uh, people in homes use UPSs because they just need to make sure that their radio and stuff stays up long enough for them to finish whatever work they're on. Uh, when you come to micro pops, you have uh, you know battery boxes outside with small batteries in them to help keep those up for longer. And then at towers, you actually have large battery setups. You've got huge banks of battery setups because you've got tons of equipment on the tower, and you want that to stay up as long as possible until power is restored at the tower or whatever might be going on. So it's best to build your your battery backups to accommodate the equipment and for a longer duration of time just so you don't have any kind of downtime, or if you do, it's not very long because you've got the power restored. Yeah, we're showing a, a battery container here, a metal battery container with some equipment inside. This is part of a solar, off-the-grid solar relay uh, 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 site, and we've taken each of these pieces in the picture and take them and bonded them to a, a copper bar, and then that goes to the uh, metal box, and then that goes to actual ground rod, within inches, so we try to keep all the leads as short as possible and go to Earth for this system, including the mass nearby that contain uh, six different uh, microwave radios. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about configuration of uh, equipment. So when it comes to configuring, uh, say, Mimosa backhaul products or even the access point client products, the most important thing you have to worry about is that uh, the access point is on one end and the station is on the other. So you want to make sure one radio is configured as the access point. The other is set up as a station so they'll talk to each other. And then you need to make sure that the, uh, the channel and power, the, uh, the actual device power is turned up enough where they'll talk to each other because mm-hmm. the longer the link, the more power you need for them to talk. So, you know, it, it depends on your antenna gain and your device power, but you want to make sure you have at least enough where they'll connect so you can kind of align your link and adjust the power as needed. And so you guys have anything you want to add to that? No, I think that explains it well. Perfect. And so then we'll come to actually testing the Internet connectivity. So you can do that by connecting to a website, going to speedtest or speedtest.net, just one of those speed tests out there. Uh, you can do a radio ping test, which is built into the radio. You also have a bandwidth test that's uh, built into the radio, so you can test between the two radios. And then you also have a trace route test in the radio where you can trace out to the Internet to a certain site or a place that you just want to make sure that your radios are able to connect to the Internet because if they are, then that means that your customer on the backside should be able to connect to the Internet as well. And you can also run IFPERF testing, which we've already talked a little bit about, one, one, you know, from one side of the link to the other to make sure that your link is actually passing you know, an appropriate amount of traffic or you know what to expect on that link as well. Uh, then well, we want to talk about uh, interference here. So uh, for those you know, watching from home, we have a, a pretty crowded spectrum here on this. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Jeff actually gave me this. It's, it's pretty bad, but this is actually down in the South America, Argentina area yeah. where... Uh, it's the wild, wild west, as, as we call it. Yes. People are, are using spectrum all over the board, you know, just hammering everything down there. So if you've listened to our previous shows, hopefully you've checked your area for interference. You definitely don't want to go through all that work and then find out that you don't have any usable spectrum for the band you're trying to use, kind of like right here in this picture. 
So all of Mimosa's radios have a built-in real-time spectrum analyzer. So after it's been powered up for about five minutes, you should have an accurate representation of spectrum usage. So uh, again, it's best to check this before, but even after you install, you can still check and look for a, a good channel on both sides because you have local, remote, and combined. So you can look at spectrum on either side of the link or, or put together. That way you know where you can kind of fit yourself into the spectrum and try to get a working link out of it. Oh, so you could just with a click, you can see the remote, you can see the local, and you can get a delta with, with both of them overlaid. Right. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about taking your radios offline to do this. Uh, like, again, it's, it's a live spectrum analyzer that you can look at whenever you want. So perfect for that. So that brings us to our tech tip of the week. Yeah, what is the tech tip of the week? What do we have? So this week's tech tip is talking about saving your support files before rebooting. Cool. So, Jeff, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So this is uh, something that's really important to us in support is that we like to get the support log files before uh, a radio has been rebooted so that we can compare that with the after uh, uh, support log. So if you are planning on rebooting your radios uh, due to some performance or, uh, say, firmware issues and that you're working with support, make sure you, you know try really hard. I know this is hard, but try really hard to uh, get those uh, support files before you do the reboot and then uh, send those off to us and we can use that to do a comparison and really get a better understanding of what's going on or not going on with your wireless network. All right, so uh, let's go over a little bit what we talked about this week. So uh, this week we talked about installation and configuration and testing of your equipment. So we talked about installing radios and antennas, cabling, grounding, and battery backups. And then we talked about configuration of the actual equipment, testing connectivity, and then looking for interference in your area if you haven't already. And so uh, that is really all the show is this week. Uh, if you do have questions, though, please submit those to podcast at mimosa.co. Uh, you're also free to post on the uh, wherever this is located at so we can kind of see if you have any questions that we can answer next week or later on as uh, questions get asked. And also, next week's show is going to be about billing and customer management. So uh, hopefully we'll see you next time on that show. Thanks for tuning in. Please hit the subscribe or follow button to stay up to date with our latest podcast, which will be available on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and SoundCloud.